I'm Felicia. I'm Ian. And we are the Paranormal Lovers. Hey guys. Hey guys. Welcome back to another week of the Paranormal Lovers. Uh, We're so happy to have you guys back. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Uh, Happy Kwanzaa. Happy Yule. Happy... Hanukkah, happy whatever you celebrate this time of year. Happy holidays to you. Uh, we are now in 2023. Yeah. 2023. It's crazy because our daughter's going to start school this year. She is, yeah. So she's going to graduate in 2036. She's growing up on us. It is. Kids grow up quick. I know people say it all the time. Enjoy them while they're young. Well, you know, the baby stage is fun. The toddler stage is hell. Just going to be honest about that. Uh, They never stop. (laughs) It never stops. All right. Uh, We appreciate everybody that tuned in and listened to us last week. We have 12, I believe, listeners thus far. Thanks, guys. Ooh, thank you. And thank you to everybody who came over and joined us on Instagram. It's going to be fun. We really appreciate all the love and support. And we hope that you guys uh, really enjoy the stuff that we send your way. Um you know this is new we're both extremely nervous people so it's going to take us a little bit to kind of get in the swing of it we'll get better we'll get better at it but we appreciate everybody that's here and listening to us this week uh let's see anything important or thrilling that's happened for you this week bill uh didn't hurt get hurt at work that that's always (laughs) a plus you need to stop that bananas (laughs) All right, so guys, this week we are still in North Carolina. We are going to take it from the mountains to the coast. And we're going to go see about a legend or two in North Carolina. Well, let me rephrase this. One of them's at the coast and one of them is actually up here in the mountains. But the second one in the mountains is just going to be a small, small little thing. So 100 miles from Cape Fear Point on Baldhead Island... Off the coast of North Carolina, uh, in Chatham County, there is a place where the Hall and the Deep Creek River converge to form the Cape Fear River. I wonder if, is that the Deep Creek from up here, or is it a different creek? It's actually Deep River. I may have said Deep Creek. Sorry about that. We do have a Deep Creek around here that's a popular place to go tubing, so I've been getting them mixed up. (laughs) But no, this is Deep River. Um... Deep and River, Deep and Hall River converge to form the Cape Fear River. Cape Fear River passes through seven counties, the river itself, in North Carolina. It is 202 miles long, and it is the longest river that is completely within the boundaries of North Carolina. Hmm. That river doesn't touch any other state, which is... Does amazing. it run like the length? No, it doesn't run the length. It's only 202 miles, and North Carolina is roughly about... 450 miles it's about half of it yeah it's about half the length of north carolina um however the cape fear river system is one of the largest in the state the system itself covers nine thousand square miles wow um and it has streams that flow from the river through 29 counties and for anybody who doesn't know north carolina has 30 no north carolina has 100 counties so that's 30 of 100 like that's 30 percent of our counties that this river touches um it's a big area it's a very big area uh there is also the cape fear estuary which runs along the coast it is a 35 mile long section of brackish saline wetland that acts as a breeding ground for many saltwater species uh it is also part of the atlantic intercoastal highway Part of this estuary, fun fact, is the Green Swamp, and the Green Swamp is one of the rare habitats for the Virginia, or the Virginia, the Venus flytrap. Nice. Which is, for anybody who doesn't know, the Venus flytrap is a carnivorous plant. It has like a little mouth on it, and when bugs land in it, it'll close, and it uses its acids to digest the bug. I wonder if they get a lot of swamp gas in that area. I'm I, probably. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a lot of swamp down there, um, and this is towards the Outer Banks, kind of down towards Wilmington area. 
Um, but the Venus flytrap is actually a native of North Carolina. That's like cool. the breeding grounds are only down there on the coast. Um, I tried to find some information about what indigenous people lived in the area before colonizers. Um, there's not a lot known about it. There's no name for the tribe that lived there that is recorded. Right. Um, there is one known recorded village called Nikois, and I apologize to any indigenous people. I'm trying. <laughs> That's all I can say. I'm trying. Um, but there were, I think there were five villages in total that was known about. There was one that was actually recorded called Nikois. Um, all I could really find is that after, whether it was due to sickness brought in by the colonizers, wars fought between the tribes themselves, wars fought between the tribes and the colonizers, um, migration or forced relocation, as we like to know they used to do with the indigenous people. Um, unless there are a few descendants left of that tribe, there's no recorded history of them, hmm. which is really sad. It is sad. Like, I hate that there's so much beauty in culture and we just don't know about it. Yeah. Um, but hey, if you, if you are listening to this, if you are from the indigenous people of the Cape Fear area and you know the history, you know what? We'd love to hear from you, so feel free to send us a message. Give us a holler. I'm always interested to learn about the indigenous people of an area. Well, let's see. Oh, one thing I did not know about the Cape Fear River is that it used to be full of Atlantic sturgeon. Um, anyone who doesn't know, sturgeon are some wild... Are those the ones that have armor? They like uh, the armor-plated fish. I think sturgeons are the ones with the pointy nose. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, there's some wild looking fish. Um, we had actually first probably seen them on Jeremy Wade on River Monsters. Uh, but yeah, that river used to be full of Atlantic sturgeon. Uh, much like salmon, they like to swim upstream to spawn. That's something I didn't know. Yeah, and their breeding grounds were upstream and, of course... You know, people enjoy caviar, which is fish eggs. Atlantic sturgeon caviar was very, very prized. And due to the hunting and harvesting of their eggs, they nearly went extinct. Um, I don't know how much, like how many there are now. I don't know what the statistics on that are. I doubt you can fish for them anymore. At least down yeah, there. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so that's sad. But it in, is sad. Yeah. It's a pretty fish. They are pretty fish. And they're a very unique fish, too. Very, mm -hmm. very unique. Um, in 1929... No. no Y'all excuse me. Okay, numbers are hard. In 1529, Spanish colonizers dubbed it the Rio Jordan. After that, it was named the Charles River. And then the Clarendon River. And then by 1733, it was commonly known as the Cape Fear River. Now, can you imagine why it was called the Cape Fear River? <laughs> <laughs> Lots of reasons. <laughs> Lots of reasons. <laughs> um, allegedly, around 1585, colonizers who came upon the mouth of the river started referring to it as the Cape Fear due to the difficulty navigating through the coves and inlets and channels and whatnot in the area. Yeah, um, a lot of shipwrecks. A lot of shipwrecks. This part of the area is also known as the Graveyard of the Atlantic, yeah. which runs along the Outer Banks. Um, and I was, ironically, I was like, wait a second, Wicked Tuna. Mm -hmm. They do their Outer Banks stuff on there all the time, and it's kind of crazy. Like, that's they the Graveyard do. of the Atlantic. And we've watched episodes where they, like, crash their boats into bridges. and like, Yeah, the Outer Banks are a treacherous place. They really Sandbars are. go all along there. Yeah, and I mean, if you're stuck on a island, if you're stuck out there during a storm, you're not getting back on land for probably a week, at yeah. least back to the mainland because the rivers. It's horrible when storms come through there and it floods real bad. And yeah. Nobody can go anywhere. Yeah, my aunt, um, she grew up on Manio on the Outer Banks in North Carolina, 
And I remember talking to her when storms would come through, and she'd be like, well, our one bridge in and out's just gone. Yeah, my friend Jason grew up there. Um, unfortunately, as you can imagine, during the Civil War, this river was a prize, a coveted prize, or control of the river was a coveted prize between the North and the South. Because if you have control of that river, that's, you know, an inlet for troops and supplies and whatnot to come in. Right. Um, and because it was essential, really, in growing the state as well. It created a passage or transportation opportunity between the coast and the Piedmont. And that's how it kind of helped spread everything throughout the state. Uh, let's see here. In night or in seventeen, I really want it to be the nineteen hundreds again. I think, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like the late nineteen hundreds, like you know, our time. I would have either been dead or done really well. <laughs> yeah, at least as you weren't in the eighteen hundreds, you know, like morbid likes to say, the eighteen hundreds of it all would kill people. So right. Uh, in seventeen forty, four <laughs> Scotsmen from and I apologize, Argyllshire bought land along the river to form the town of Lockville. Uh, there was a man that came to settle in the town by the name of Ambrose Ramsey. He was the owner of the mill and the tavern, named Ramsey's Tavern. That sounds like a cool place. It does sound like a cool place. Um, Ramsey's, Ramsey's Tavern was built upstream of the convergence of the two rivers along Deep River. And it's funny that you said Deep Creek because I put on my notes, Deep Creek, that you? Because um, <laughs> that's what I thought when I was typing it up. I was like, wait, Deep Creek? Nope, that said river. Okay. Uh, as you can imagine that the tavern was probably one of the only places for soldiers during the Revolutionary War to go get a drink, kick off steam with their buddies. Sure. Um, probably pretty popular yeah probably pretty popular and i can imagine it would be interesting to see the patrons of the bar kind of shift depending on who has control of the area right like one week you'll have or maybe like both sides came in and they were just eyeballing each other like at the end of the bar yeah and this was like the revolutionary war so you've got like these americans quote unquote in there and then like, are the British coming in there, too, to have a drink? Maybe. Like, what's going on? Might be all three, just the little love triangle going on at the bar. I mean, hey, we're not actually out in the field. Let's get a beer. Um, so it was these soldiers who reported seeing mermaids sitting on a sandbar at the convergent of the two rivers. This spot has since been known as Mermaid Point. Hmm. Now, some people would wonder... That's a hundred miles from the coast. That's nowhere near the ocean. So why are there mermaids up here? Right. Well, according to some legends, mermaids can be pretty vain. And let me tell you, saltwater's hell on the hair. Hell on the hair. Um, right. So the mermaids would swim up the Cape Fear River to sit on the sandbar, and they would wash and comb out their hair. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, they were shy. Anytime someone would try to speak to them or walk up to them, they'd dive under the water and disappear. Hmm. Nobody, nope, nope, don't want no strange men coming from the tavern and talking to me while I'm out here washing my hair. No, thank you. It should be noted, though, that most, if not all, of the reports did come from people leaving the tavern. Right. Going home. So... You know, alcohol probably played a mix in a lot of those, but... Could have been just some ladies washing, and they were like, oh, God. Men. Men, swim away. Run away. Run away. Um, but it was a frequent claim, as this path actually was one of the main paths to and from the town to the tavern, or to, like, where people live to the tavern, so... Pretty much everybody had to go past this place. Is there a cat? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can hear our cat in the background. <laughs> she wants in. Yeah, our little live. podcast room. She'll live. Um, 
Some people believe that the war may have been to blame also for pushing the mermaids up that far the coast. Because I can imagine that, you know, the sounds of war and warships and people and traffic and well, the animals. Po- popularity of the ports. Yeah, and then the popularity of the place. It's a beautiful place in there. I'm sure there's plenty of places down there that mermaids could groom. But I wouldn't want to do it around all those people either. Um, unfortunately, well, I guess fortunately, with how things go, dams and locks were built along the river Mm -hmm. um, during the evolution of the state growing. And so some people believe that the mermaids were cut off from Mermaid's Point due to that. Um, But also in the early 1900s, the Buckhorn Dam was built as a hydroelectric power station. And due to that, the water levers, levels rose right. in the river, and thus the sandbar was completely submerged. Hmm. So there is nowhere. No more Mermaid Point? No. Well, technically it's still called Mermaid Point, but there is no sandbar no longer at Mermaid Point. Right. So there's nowhere for the ladies <clears throat> to come clean out their hair. Um, also in the 1900s, Ramsey's Town Tavern, as well as many places within Lockville, were destroyed by a flood. Hmm. So, unfortunately, the tavern is not there anymore. Right. Um, and then the land that held the town of Lockwood was merged into surrounding towns. Global whamming. <laughs> Global whamming. That's the 1900s. Stuff flooded. Yeah. So, that is the... That was the story of the mermaids of the Cape Fear. Cool. Yeah. I'd like to go down there. Yeah. It's a beautiful place. It is a beautiful place. And there was a movie, and I vaguely remember this movie, and it has nothing to do with Cape Fear, except for maybe being set in it, but it came out when I was like five. Yeah. (laughs) But it's called Cape Fear. Huh. And it came out, I think, in 1991. But I think it's about, like, a murderer that gets out of prison and goes on a rampage. So, not the same. Right. Um, So, to bring it back up here to the mountains for a little bit, I want to bring you guys up here and tell you of a little legend of a siren in the French Broad River. Creepy. French Broad is actually a river that we see quite frequently. Um, See a lot of people tubing there. Yeah, there's a lot of water activity on this river, and I'm going to give you some facts about it in a minute, but I do not recommend ever putting a toe in the French Broad River if you come up to Asheville. Yeah, don't do it. Because there's a lot of tubing companies, there's a lot of like paddle board companies, canoe, kayak companies, but let me tell you... It's a big old wide river. But it's not the cleanest at all. It's not the cleanest, and it does not have it have very good uh, environmental tests in the last few years. So if you ever decide to come up here, I'm just going to ask you, don't do that. Okay? No, don't do it. There's cleaner rivers that you can swim in here than, than that one. Yeah, don't do that one. But the French Broad River is one of the oldest rivers in the world. Um, again, we're in the Appalachian Mountains, so Appalachian Mountains are old as well. Um, some estimates have it being between 260 and 325 million years old. Obviously on the high end of the estimates, I imagine. But, yeah, probably so. Um, the headwaters of the French Broad River can actually be found in Rosman, North Carolina. I've heard of it. Yeah, where the North Fork and the West Fork rivers converge or the west fork of the french broad river converge um it is one of the few rivers that actually flows at least partially north to south Hmm. so or is it south to north i don't know it goes the opposite way the way rivers normally go because it goes from like north carolina through tennessee and then up Right. The country. And then it comes back down. Um, it runs 219 miles from Rosman until it flows into the Holston River in Tennessee. The waters of the French Broad then flow through five other rivers in several states before making its way to the Gulf of Mexico. Huh. 
Yeah. Didn't actually know that. Looked at a map of it, and it's 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 pretty wild. Like it goes. Listen, geography is not my strong suit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, th- I want to say it runs up two or three states, and then it comes back down and runs back down to the Gulf of Mexico. Right. It just r- twists and winds a weird way. Yeah. Okay. Um, allegedly, and I will say allegedly, hang on, guys. I will say allegedly when I speak of, uh, when I speak of legends and things that come from indigenous peoples and their tribes because while I would love to believe that these legends and whatnot are truly theirs unless it comes out of an indigenous person's mouth I don't have much trust in it coming from someone else right you know it's just the way it is hate it love it I don't care um but while there's not much that I could find about the actual legend um, it is allegedly a Cherokee legend. That's cool. Yeah. Um, I would like to go to Cherokee. This is one of the main reasons why I want to go to Cherokee because I would like to talk to some people on the reservation. Yeah. Cherokee is a, a local Indian tribe. Yeah. It's the Eastern band of the Cherokee Indians. Um, yeah. they have the reservation you know it's really cool they have their own laws and stuff they just legalized medical cannabis which is amazing and i'm so excited (laughs) right (laughs) um it's good for them like yeah it'll it'll be good for them they have they kind of have a bad drug problem over there yeah it's really hard i mean that's what they're trying to do with it you and i have talked a lot about like generational trauma and stuff like that and indigenous people you know, alongside black people, have the worst generational trauma. Well, sure. I mean, they got all the stuff going on even now. I mean, they have to, like, live on the res to get government money for the land that the government took from them to begin with. It's, it's, it, just, right. a, it's just a crock of crap. Right. But Right. So, if this is not an actual legend or if you've never heard of it, I apologize. It is not meant to offend. This is what I could find online. Um, cool. It's stated that the Cherokee's <clears throat> most known name for the river is Taki Osti, which means racing waters. Uh, colonizers called it the Broad River, as it was shown on a map of indig- indigenous territories. By 1776, the French had been added due to French occupation west of the Blue Ridge. A wee wee. Wee wee. Ha ha. Napoleon and his little (laughs) (laughs) pee-pee. We were talking about this earlier. I really wish I could have seen this place before colonizers got here. Yeah. Like when it was just indigenous people living off the land and they were like, you know. I would say I would have been one of them, but uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe you do have some ethnicity, some indigenous ethnicity, but you also have like some Scottish ethnicity and Irish and I don't know. I'm a mutt. Yeah, we both are. <laughs> um, Mostly English, though, because the English, you know, how they were back then. Bastards. They just kind of <sighs> took everything from everybody. Yeah. So, the first known, or first well-recorded um, thing about the siren was a poem that appeared in print in William Gilmore Sims. Oh, I'm sorry. Tezeleka, a tradition of the French broad. Hmm. Um, it was more ri- widely popularized by the 1896 retelling in Charles Montgomery Skinner's Myth and Legends of Our Land. Not Sweet. our land, but okay. Um, it is said that a hiker will find themselves setting up camp by the river. But his sleep is disturbed with dreams of a dark-haired woman singing and calling out to him. Hmm. He doesn't get much rest that night. And when he stops to set up camp the next day, he realizes he hasn't made it as far as he thought he should have. Hmm. This time, at midnight, he hears a woman's voice singing and calling out to him. He opens up his tent to investigate. Finds himself 
walking out and laying down on the rocks by the river. And then he falls asleep. When he wakes up the next day, all he can remember is the woman, the sound of her voice. As the third day of hiking comes to an end, the hiker sets up camp. But instead of going inside for having a meal, he sits down on a rock by the river's edge and waits. Huh. Doesn't take long for him to begin hearing the sweet melody of that voice calling out to him singing to him beckoning that's so creepy (laughs) he stands up and he walks to the water's edge and he looks down and when he looks down he sees a beautiful woman coming up from the water to join him and she's beckoning him to her so he does he goes and he walks into the river to join her and as he does He is wrapped in an embrace of scaly and cold arms. And it's not a loving embrace. It's not tender. It's a cold. More like an undead embrace. Determined (laughs) embrace. (laughs) I had written scaly and cold. And then I wrote scaled and icy if you're a 21 Pilots fan. So. (laughs) (laughs) But not in a loving embrace. No, no. She grabs him and she drags his ass to the depths of the river oh that's so creepy and unfortunately with both I could not find any written you know documentation of um, actual reports of people seeing them yeah but it's really weird because there's been people missing along that river (laughs) it's because like Asheville has a pretty bad uh, homeless problem and most of the time well a lot of times they'll set up camp down by the river and there's been like uh, I don't want to say this number you know for sure or not but something like 17 people go missing along the river's edge or murdered <laughs> yeah. like don't quote you on that but yeah it's it's been a lot of people um, it's kind of it's weird I like, could see one of them like just doing all those steps that you just said uh. yeah I could totally see that like I could even see somebody like you who's like not homeless or something just out just a regular hiker yeah just out hiking and camping and stuff in the woods and then you just set up camp beside a river and then you hear it's like well he was he was supposed to be home yesterday he's not home still yet uh what happened yeah i can't imagine like what people actually do have to go through like if somebody's out on a hiking trip and they go missing and you just find their tent it creeps me out that it's like several days long like they've been enchanted or something yeah yeah and a lot of people a lot of times when you hear about like mermaids and sirens it's off the coast yeah it's out in the ocean Mm -hmm. or like right on the coast of like some rocky shore or something and it's a group of sirens or mermaids singing to a ship yeah, I can imagine a whole group of sailors like spending a whole week chasing a mermaid or something like that. Yeah, or even just like them singing out to them and then just like crashing their ship on yep. the rocks or something because they're mm-hmm. trying to get to them. But yeah, the thought of like over three days, this woman's like invading your thoughts. She's invading your dreams. She's sinking into your subconscious and you just can't like stop thinking about her. Like you've been hypnotized. Yeah, essentially like you've been hypnotized and that's that's one of the i mean that's the main lore especially around sirens not so much mermaids but sirens they're the ones and 21 pilots (laughs) i'm confused (laughs) (laughs) they hypnotize you with their sound oh yeah see this is true this is very true i love me some 21 pilots biggest fan hi tyler hi joseph how y'all doing um yeah it's i don't know it's uh I probably sh- I wish I'd looked a little more into like the hmm what's the word for it societal aspect or influence like the influence that society had on the lore of sirens because I feel like there's got to be some patriarchal bullshit behind like a beautiful woman sitting on a rock luring men to their death. Well, I'm sure with sailors they probably would like tell each other about it and then go out to hunt them yeah that did happen a lot um it's kind of wild like 
and then also wind up dead. Yeah. Yeah. They go out hunting them and then they don't find anything, of course, because even if there are mermaids out there, which, oh, y'all listen, Appalachia's home. I've lived here for over 20 years, but my soul home is the ocean. I can definitely see why mermaids and sirens aren't really fucking with people. You're not going to find them if you go out looking for them. Right. That's just not going to happen. They're not sitting on shore, singing to men, bringing them to their death. They're living in the depths away from people because humans are trash. (laughs) Yeah, I could see that too. (laughs) They're just living down there because humans are trash. Um, So yeah, that's our, that's our little, uh, water cryptids of North Carolina, water spirits of North Carolina. Um, Next week, I'm going to be going a little spook spookier. Uh, Sweet. I'll be touching on some ghosts and some truly paranormal activities, you know. Spooky. Got to live up to our name. Yeah. I mean, for cryptids sure. are paranormal and weird too, but got to get some ghosts in there. Well, so. I, can't, I can't wait for some of these tales. Oh, they're going to be fun. They will be. They're going to be real fun. So, guys, thank you for joining us again today. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to us. Um, if you'd like to, head on over to Instagram. You can find us at The Paranormal Lovers. Um, send us an email if you have any personal stories of anything paranormal, alien, cryptid, conspiracy. If you know of any conspiracies, if you know of anybody who knows of any conspiracies, Send us your stories at the paranormal lovers at yahoo.com. Anything else? No, I think that's it. No, that's it. All right. Well, we will see you guys next week. See you guys. Bye bye. <laughs>